Hello everyone, I'm Chloe Johnson and welcome to this Fresh Business Thinking webinar series, Lockdown Learning for Businesses, supported by BT. BT Skills for Tomorrow aims to empower businesses and their employees with the digital skills to help grow their business. The Skills for Tomorrow website includes free learning content that small businesses and their employees can access at any time on topics such as connecting with customers on a mobile, making sure your customers can find you online and much more. To find out more, you can click on the link in the comments. Coronavirus is continuing to be a challenge for small businesses and entrepreneurs across the UK. The outbreak leaves an overwhelming uncertainty into the future for business owners. But this is a time when as a business community, we need to come together and support one another. And we're lucky enough to work with organisations and individuals who are passionate about supporting entrepreneurs during this difficult time. One of those is our speaker today, the consumer champion, Martin Newman. Martin is a force for positive change for both consumers and brands. He's leveraged his 37 years of experience working in consumer sectors, heads up multi-channel operations for some of the world's leading brands, including Burberry, Harrods and Ted Baker. Today, Martin will give you his perspective on what he thinks consumer-facing businesses will need to adapt to COVID-19 and how to meet consumer expectations. Martin will be talking for around 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for a Q&A. If you do have any questions for Martin, leave them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll do our best to get to them later on in the session. That's all for me for now and I'll pass over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Chloe. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, first of all, I would just like to say to everybody, I hope that you're uh, all doing well in this particular, particularly difficult time and that everybody's keeping as well as can possibly be expected. Bear me two seconds. So I'm going to talk about customer centricity in a post-coronavirus world, but I'm going to talk about obviously what's happening now and how I think our behavior is likely to evolve and therefore what that means for consumer facing businesses and what we need to do in order to engage with consumers uh, based on the change in the, the behavior that we're all likely to go through. First thing I want to point out is this little man here, his name is Dougal, is my miniature schnauzer, and I can tell you right now, I don't live in a huge house, and if the doorbell goes, this wee man is gonna go ballistic. So if you hear any barking in the background, I will apologize for that in advance. A Little bit about me, um, just to build on what Chloe was saying. Um, I've had the privilege of working for some amazing organizations throughout my career. I headed up online and multi-channel operations for the likes of Burberry Harrods, for Ted Baker, not for Speedo directly, but, but for Pentland Brands, who are the multi-brand owner of Speedo and many other organizations. I had the privilege of building a business called Practicology, um, which we then found a great home for with an American business called Pattern a couple of years ago. Um, I'm on the advisory board of Yext, which is a digital asset management platform, also driving ask and answer solutions on uh, brands' websites. Clearpay, who are the leading uh, buy now, pay later solution provider in the United Kingdom. Um, I also have the privilege of being on the advisory board, or sorry, being a trustee rather on the board of InKind Direct, which is a fantastic charity which actually provides support for thousands of charities around the UK, and they've never needed it more than they do so right now. And recently had the great privilege of joining the board of the retail arm of the Scouts. So that's a little bit about me. Um, in case you're interested, I have written a book about this stuff, about customer centricity, uh, which has been doing fairly well. And I'm now on my second one, which will be out next year. It was, a, it was shortlisted for the Business Book of the Year Awards last year. I thought rather selfishly they gave it to someone else. But there you go, can't win them all. Um, you may occasionally see my ugly mug popping up on television. I'll be on BBC in a couple of weeks. I was on Radio Wales uh, this week. Arguably, I've got a face for radio, so I do quite a lot of radio work. LBC, BBC Scotland, Radio Wales, and so on and so forth, talking about what's happening basically within retail and, and other related uh, issues. Uh, about a year ago, I launched a business called Customer Service Action, which is essentially a platform that's trying to drive positive change for both consumers and brands, but I'm not here to talk about that. What I am here is to talk about what's happening and, and how it's going to affect us all. So it has been a crazy time. And I'm sure most of you can identify with this signpost here, um, which, which qualifies, I guess, that we've all been disorientated, we've been confused, we've been a little bit lost, probably a bit depressed at certain times throughout this, uh, the course of this period of time. But as human beings, we always overcome adversity. Um, there have been so many events over, over, the, over the years, obviously not many of us remember the Great Depression. Uh, Captain Tom, or Colonel Tom as he is now, the, the, 
a fantastic man who's who's uh, created all the buzz around generating millions and millions of pounds of donations for the NHS and associated charities. Um, he would have remembered the Great Depression, World War II, uh, the dot-com crash, 9-11, when none of us thought we'd get on a plane after 9-11. Well, it didn't take that long for our behaviour to change as far as that was concerned. Of course, we had the global financial crash of 2008, and now we've got COVID-19. So we do have a new normal. That's the long and short of it. You'll hear this term being used fairly frequently. However, sorry, two seconds. My tech doesn't seem to want to move on. Um, the new normal is a period of transition, and it's a period of transition prior to the next normal. So we're going to go through a few phases of new normal. Uh, the one at the moment is the one that we're in, and then hopefully when Boris next week tells us what the lockdown exit strategy looks like, that'll begin the phase of the next new normal. You'd be quite entitled to be sitting there thinking that everything is going to change off the back of what's happening right now. But I honestly don't think that it will. I think there will be some change and some of that will be permanent and some of it will be temporary. And throughout the course of my deck today, I'm going to try and qualify or highlight what I think will be a term te temporary change rather versus a permanent change. This is a study from uh, University College London that said that they, they studied 100 uh, adults and they, they basically were able to determine that it took 66 days for a habit, a new habit to stick. But those individual times varied from at the lowest end 18 days at the highest end 254. So this was the average of 66 days. That's quite a long time. I'm pretty sure we haven't been in lockdown for 66 days yet. Psychographic segmentation has never been more relevant. I'm sure you've all heard of demographics and other various forms of segmentation. What I mean by psychographic segmentation is about how we feel and how we feel has become, I think, far more important than who we are. So for brands that are targeting consumers, it's really understanding what the, what the impact of this has been on, our, on us, how we feel about things and, and what that, how, that, how that manifests itself in terms of our behavior. Now, this is some research that I actually picked up today from Ipsos Mori and just wanted to talk you through a few of the, few of the uh, percentages and the headlines, I guess, from this. Not surprisingly, uh, not many of us fancy the idea of attending a public event anytime soon. Likewise, not many of us fancy going on public transport. A slightly larger number would be prepared to go to bars and restaurants. Increased number would uh, be happy sending our children back to school. I could probably imagine why that would be. Uh, and, and maybe slightly surprisingly, a fairly significant number of us are prepared to go back to work and do other shopping, um, as well as shop in other supermarkets. And of course, the one that came out top was meeting family and friends because, oh crikey, I've just realized. Oops, hang on. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I thought I, <clears throat> I thought for a second I was on mute. My, my apologies, give me two seconds. Slight faux pas there on my part. There we go, sorry about that. Um, safety and safeguarding has replaced convenience as the key driver. So I'm not suggesting that convenience isn't still important because that absolutely is. But clearly when we go into a supermarket, we want to feel that we're going to be um, socially distancing from other consumers, uh, having things picked up at the curbside, having things brought out to us, having things left on our doorstep, ordering food online. These are all behaviours that we have started to pick up um, in the, uh, during the coronavirus period. So what I'm going to talk about now is, and I've got these little icons here to qualify what I think is going to be a temporary change versus something that's going to be a permanent change. So first of all, with regards to consumer behavior and customer segments, there is no one size fits all. And I think that we are going to primarily adopt one of three core behaviors. On the left hand side, you've got that group of customers who just cannot wait to get out. We've been cooped up for however many weeks, seven, eight weeks by the time we probably get out of this. Um, and they cannot wait to get going. They may have been in the house with young kids for a long period of time and are desperate to get back out there, get shopping and get out and about their life. The next segment is a, <clears throat> a group of customers I'm calling keep calm and carry on. I'd probably fall into that bracket. So these customers are likely to stay local. They're certainly going to get on with living their lives, but they're going to be very cautious about what they do and where they go. 
And then you've got coronaphobia. And, you know, unfortunately, and, and I'm not making light of it, the reality is that obviously what we've been through has absolutely had, you know, a huge impact on many, many consumers. And there are countless numbers of people who probably haven't left their homes for the whole period of lockdown, either because they've been told they can't leave or because they've been too scared to leave. And I do think that some of that behavior will continue. However, fundamentally, all this behavior, in my opinion, is definitely a temporary change. It's not a permanent change. Will we see this anytime soon? Will we be prepared to be in retail environments packed full of other human beings like this? I doubt it very much, but again, that is a term and, sorry, a temporary change. It's not gonna last. And I'm sure that in the, in the near future, we will be more confident to shop like that. Supermarkets feel busy. For those of you that have been going to the grocers, they still feel pretty busy and there's only so much they can do to really manage social, social distancing. And there have been many, many consumers over the course of this period of time who have actually bought online for the first time. Many people, many new customers have, a, have a procured groceries online, which they've never done so before. Do I think that's gonna be a permanent change? I absolutely do. If you realize how easy it is to buy products online when you're not used to doing it, then there's a good chance many of you will continue some of that behavior. And of course, let's not forget the A to Z of retail and all things, and that is Amazon. And let's be, you know, there are some of you who probably don't, maybe don't like Amazon as a brand, or thought you would never want to buy from Amazon, but I'm sure they come in pretty handy at this time. And, you know, they've been a great fillet for, for all of us because we've been able to pretty much order anything from Amazon over this course of time. Who's going to go into a changing room anytime soon when our fashion retailers open up their stores? I do believe this is going to be an issue. I'm going to talk about some of the issues now that I think fashion retailers in particular have to address. And I do think consumers are going to be highly reluctant to go into a changing room not knowing who's been in there beforehand. And that's where something like Tried, which is essentially they're really a logistic provider with electric bikes, they were already enabling retailers to offer customers to try before you buy in your own in your own home. And I think this will become very prevalent in the next six months when retailers open their doors. Not only fashion retailers, but you could be selling technical equipment, you could be selling computers, anything really. And this is a great way to get products into the hands of consumers in an environment that they're comfortable in where they feel safe, which is obviously their own living room. The supply chain has always been talked about as something that's owned by the business, but I really think supply chain now is a core consumer focus. We've all seen this, I mean, all joking aside with the uh, overstocking and panic buying toilet rolls and everything else, but I definitely do feel that this changes consumer mindset and that we are def we're not going to be prepared to accept you know, out of stocks in the future. There's still lots of websites you can go on today where frustratingly, you know, they're out of sizes of a particular product or, or a particular brand that you're looking for, or whether you're going into the grocers. Um, this is something that we, that, that the, all, all, of, all retailers need to address because as consumers, I don't think we're gonna put up with it. And that's a permanent change. This is what fashion might look like in 2021, all joking aside, that's probably a picture from the early 80s. Um, but fashion in 2021 is going to look a little bit like fashion in 2020. And I'm not making light of it because the reality is that fashion retailers who have had their stores shuttered, obviously most have still been selling online over, over the last few weeks, um, will be left with an awful lot of stock. Um, but one of the things that I think, and I think this is a temporary change, I don't think it's a permanent change. But one of the things that I think it might lead to is the end of spring, summer and autumn, winter. So for those of you that are aware, whether you work in fashion or you just like buying fashion, fashion uh, retailers historically buy in two cycles. They buy for spring, summer, and they buy for autumn, winter. And one of the biggest issues every year is that they're left with an awful lot of stock at the end of each of these uh, seasons, basically, or these buys. Why? Because consumers haven't bought product because maybe they ha it hasn't been appropriate for the climate. So retailers are buying in autumn winter product it's in their stores usually from the end of august you think about it when was the last time we had a cold august a cold september or even a really cold october more often these days it doesn't really start to kick in winter until november and i think that this might lead to the end of spring summer and autumn winter so that could be a permanent change and why wouldn't you have a scenario like this where you can go into any retail business 
on any day of the year and you can pick up anything you want for any season. It's very frustrating from a consumer perspective to go into a fashion retailer and not be able to buy a swimsuit in November or December because the fashion retailer hasn't bought that product for that time of year, but you're about to go on holiday. So that could be a permanent change that we see. What I'd ask you to do now is just close your eyes and imagine what retail looked like in the 1960s. Go on, indulge me for two seconds. What did retail look like in the 1960s? And if you open them again, <clears throat> it might look a little bit like this. And this is a series of um, artisanal, independent retail propositions all in and around the London area. All look fantastic. They all give you a feel, don't they, like they're from a bygone era. It feels like they're out of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, maybe even earlier. And I think that this is the future of retail. I, I absolutely don't think high, high street retail is going anywhere, despite the fact that sadly we have lost a lot of retailers in the last year or two. We've also lost some since the start of the coronavirus, and I'm sure we will lose more. But I think what we'll find in the future is a better balance of independent retail, specialist independent retail, artisanal independent retail, along with some national retail businesses. So I see that being a permanent change. There are also platforms around for independent retailers that can help them go beyond their local high street. So even an independent retailer that only has one store somewhere like High Barnet around where I live, you could be on down your high street, which is a platform that gives that digital presence for independent retailers. And it has, it has all of the um, services and propositions you'd expect, such as ClearPay, I mentioned earlier, which is a buy now, pay later solution. They're supporting the high street. They've got a very strong delivery proposition. This has enabled hundreds of retailers, hundreds of independent retailers in the UK to stay in business. Without this platform, hundreds of independent retailers would probably have gone bust during this period, but it's enabled them to continue to sell. Apologies for the next picture. Experience, experiential retailer will definitely lure us back into physical retail. Um, I do a lot of high street videos and looking at what different retailers are doing. This was in New York uh, last year. This is in the CoverGirl store in Times Square where you don't even need to try the product on. It's using um, augmented reality and you can just pick up a product and it will basically project onto your face what the lipstick would look like. I thought I looked very fetching in that particular lipstick if I do say so myself. And I do think that experiential retail is the future because if you're not giving a great experience in the physical environment, then why on earth would a consumer want to go in there in the first place? Cash anyone? No, can't imagine too many of you, even those of you who are venturing out at the moment into physical retail um, will be using cash at the moment. Um, we, are we are moving very much towards cashless and cardless payment environments. We do have to bear in mind that many there are still a sizable number of consumers that live in our society today who unfortunately don't have access to a bank account. We still have to cater for them. So I'm not advocating for the removal of cash. I just think that given its propensity to transmit something like coronavirus, uh, most of us are going to be sticking to uh, you know, uh, touchless payments. Just on this note, I read a, a rather amusing anecdote this week uh, from Canada that Canadian citizens are stuffing as much cash as they can into their washing machines in order to clean them and remove any sign of COVID-19. I thought that that's bringing money laundering to a whole new level. That is going to be a permanent change. The other thing that I think is going to be a permanent change with retail in the future is the use of the physical space. So we all know that there are lots of empty spaces on our high streets and we all know that landlords, by the way, are struggling as well and are in a very difficult situation at the moment as well and we have to think about their business. But landlords are going to have to really rethink, you know, the fact that they can't sell 10 or 20 year leases anymore. Who's going to take out that length of lease on a physical retail store anymore in the near future? Not many, not many businesses would have the confidence to do that. So they're going to have to repurpose them. They're going to have to make the spaces available for pop-ups. They're going to have to make the space available on short-term leases. You know, why couldn't John Lewis have a small format store in my local high street in High Barnet? Why does it have to open hundreds of thousands of square feet of a department store? There's no need for that. They can still take the brand and go with a curated range and access consumers in physical environments. Um, this, is a, this is a brand in, um, called Best Days Vintage in Colchester. There was a really good initiative led by a guy called Neil Gibb, who I know, and it's the uh, South Lanes project where they've basically taken a bunch of retail stores and tried to repurpose them and turn them into something more engaging. 
in this particular vintage store, you can go in and have a cup of tea or coffee, you can have a scone or a sandwich, um, you can see all the vintage products there on the left hand side. What you can't see out of screen on the back of the store is that at the end of the week, they clear all the products off the shop floor, they've got a stage there and they have a band in and they have a gig. So what they're doing is they're thinking about how do we turn this traditional retail space into something that gives people more reason to come in, come in and have a tea or coffee, come in and buy some products, or come in and be entertained on a Friday night. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. That's also going to make these spaces a lot more profitable. The next thing I want to talk about is about keeping in touch on an emotional level. Um, see you on this, the other side, this really nice card here. You know, we are all in this together. We, are, we have all been affected by this in so many different ways. I don't think you'll find a single human being who hasn't felt almost like they've been knocked down by Mike Tyson and not really knowing what's happened to them. You know, it's a crazy, crazy situation that none of us have experienced in our lifetime. It's just bizarre. But I think one of the, way, one of the really important things for any brand to do, whether you're a retailer, a car dealer, or a restaurant, doesn't matter how difficult a time you're having at the moment, is also showing your customers that you care about them. How about sending them a card? Most of you have a database. Send them a little card in the post. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I have a meeting with someone, I like to send them a handwritten note. How nice is it to get a handwritten note these days when all we ever get is emails? Send them a card and just say you're thinking about them and you hope them and their family are all well and you look forward to seeing them on the other side. I'm sure people will remember that. And that needs to be a permanent change. Where, is e where are e-commerce sales going to land when things calm down? So those of you that know me know I've stuck my ugly head above the parapet before and I've been quoted as saying that I thought that e-commerce probably wouldn't get to more than 40% of total retail sales. Now that was before the pandemic started. And of course at the moment it's probably 80 or 90% of total retail sales are not far off that. Um, it was 20% pre-pandemic, so prior to this kicking off, so go back to February, e-commerce was approximately 20% of total retail. Where do I think it will land post-coronavirus, when everything's calmed down? 25 to 30%. Some of you might think it's going to be a lot more than that. I don't. I think physical retail will come back. But even 25 to 30%, that's an enormous uplift. That's many, many billions of pounds from where we are today and that's going to require all of you to make significant investments in the right technology, the right skill set, the right processes, the right level of customer engagement. So a lot of change to come. All consumer sectors have to adapt to the new normal, both the new normal now and in the future. Who fancies a test drive right now? So if you're a car dealer or a car showroom, you're going to be pretty worried, I would have thought, about what happens next. Not only because buying a new car is probably not going to be top of the agenda for most people in the short term, but when somebody does want to, how do you go about that? Are you really going to be prepared to sit in a car alongside a car salesman? Probably not. Maybe video conferencing is one way to overcome that. Maybe you could do a virtual test drive. I think there are lots of ways they can overcome it, but that's one of the things that's going to have to be addressed. How about a hot, sweaty workout? So I love a hot, sweaty workout, and I normally go to Cycle, which is my favorite spinning studio in London, and I love being in there, and I love the feeling of it. I get, it's just such a fantastic experience. How many of us are gonna be doing that anytime soon? Probably not many. Your home is your castle, and that is where you feel safe. And so I think that, you know, brands like Cycle, Pure Gym, David Lloyd, I think they're now going to have to move towards a combined model, not a temporary one where they're doing online classes on Instagram at the moment, but I think they're going to have to move to a physical and a digital model and let their customers choose how they interact with them. Do I have a workout in your gym or, do I, or your studio or do I have a workout in my home but still engaging with your instructors? So I think it's an opportunity, but I definitely think this is the way they're going to have to go, certainly in the short to medium term until all of us feel comfortable going back into the physical gym environment. Benidorm, anyone? Probably not anytime soon. And I think, again, most of us are going to be staycationing. So again, if you think about high street retail and independent retail, well, actually, as long as we're allowed out and we're allowed to staycation, and I hope we are because I've already booked to go to Cornwall in August, then you know the independent retailers there are going to benefit from from our uh, from our our pound and our spend that would normally be spent going abroad. So staycation and local businesses are probably going to get a boost 
Is international travel going to come back? Of course it's going to come back. Like I said earlier, remember 9-11, most of us felt pretty scared and um, you know, petrified probably about getting on a plane in the immediate aftermath of that, but it didn't take that long for, that, for that, those concerns to sort of dissipate and for us to have the confidence to do so again. But I do think this is going to be a permanent change, not in the sense that we're not going abroad, but I think that this is going to probably drive a lasting shift in the percentage of consumers that choose an international holiday over a staycation. I see staycations rising over the next few years. What about the pub? Boy, haven't we all missed going to the pub? Uh, I'm sure we're all partaking of a reasonable amount of alcohol. That's one sector that's doing pretty well at the moment. But how many of us are going to feel confident going into that environment anytime soon? You know, it's probably going to look a little bit like this pub in Westminster. I think this is the politicians, some of the politicians there. Maybe they're not that sociable. But anyway, uh, that's what social distancing is probably going to look like in a pub compared to the one on the left. Kind of kills the atmosphere, doesn't it? But this is not the end for pubs and it's not the end for restaurants. They just need to think outside the box. What could they be doing to continue to engage with customers? We've all been doing these mad quizzes with our families and friends. Why couldn't they do the same thing? Why couldn't they run, you know, quizzes, quiz nights, you know, happy hours? They could, be still, they could still be selling the product. They could be delivering to the customer's home and they could continue that engagement. And again, giving consumers a choice of coming into the physical environment or engaging with them in the digital world. And I think that could be potentially a permanent change moving forward. Consumer sentiment is changing. And I think that values have become more, sorry, have become as, if not more relevant than value. So whereby historically we look for value in the things that we buy, I'm not suggesting that that's gonna disappear, but I think that actually the values of the business that we engage with has become and is becoming more important. And I think that this period of time probably helps to, to bring the focus on that even more. You know, I've always aspired to someone like Richard Branson. He's found himself in a bit of a PR scrum ash, as we say in Glasgow, um, because obviously he's, asking, he's been asking the government for a bailout when obviously he's a very wealthy man. So I think how entrepreneurs like Richard Branson or entrepreneurs like Mike Ashley or hotels in Abbeymore who you know, on the day they decide to close their hotel, tell all their foreign staff, which constituted the majority of their staff, that they're all homeless and they're sorry, but they've all lost their jobs. These businesses will be remembered. And I really do think a lot of consumers will remember how different brands behave. So I think it's really important that leaders of these businesses think about the importance of values to consumers and what that means, not only now, but moving forward. So that I see as a permanent change. I hope we all come out of this feeling a little bit more aware of the food that we eat and the food that we waste. You know, there are tens of thousands of people homeless in this country who can barely, you know, who, who really struggle to get a hot meal at any time of the year. And let's be honest, myself and all of you included have been stockpiling over this period and have probably thrown out countless amounts of vegetables, countless amounts of fruit and other products that we just didn't really need or that we over purchased in the first place. Um, so I do think that one of the thing, positive things that hopefully come from this is we'll be much more cognizant of that in the future. And then also hopefully a bit more uh, giving in the future to people that might need that support. Um, purpose before profit. And brands that do that, I think, are the brands that will win in the long run. Timson's a brand I've always had a lot of respect for. You can get your keys cut there. You can get your shoes rehealed there. This was, a, this was a board outside one of their stores that said, if you're unemployed, and you need an outfit clean for an interview, we will clean it for free, right? Do they do dry cleaning? No. Is this an opportunity for them? Is this a play from Timson to get more money out of your pocket? Of course it's not. What this is about is saying, we care about our community, we care about you. If you're hard done by, we're gonna give you a little bit of a leg up if we can. That's all that is. And that goes, I think, a long way. And that is what I call putting purpose before profit. And that needs to be a permanent change, as does putting the planet before profit. Hotel Chocolat, their planet pledge, not easy for me to say, around packaging. 100% of our packaging will be compostable, reusable, or recyclable by 2021. Now, how many times have we heard brands say, we'll be fully sustainable by 2030, by 2050, by 2025? Sorry, it's not good enough. Here's a business that says, you know what? We're going, to put a, we're going to put a line in the sand. 
We're going to do everything we can to achieve it, and it's next year. Now, whether that's still the target or not, I don't know. But I think that that's what all of our consumer-facing businesses need to be need to be doing, and in order to ensure that we have a planet that's fit for purpose for us, for our children, and for our children's children. Permanent change. I think the age of consumerism is dead, not for everyone, but for quite a lot of us. And what I mean by that is that the time or the time when we used to buy stuff just because we could, I do think that's a thing of the past. And I think if you think of your all of you, stop piling aside, if you think of all of your own behaviors over the last sort of six weeks, seven weeks, by the time we come out of this, you must, be, you must have been thinking to yourself, do I really need that? Do I really need a new pair of jeans? Do I really need a new little black, black dress? Do I really need that new pair of trainers? Question mark. And I think this will change our behavior and make us much more conscious of what we buy. So how does that impact fashion? Well, fast fashion might become not so fast fashion. Um, is it going away? No, definitely not. But it might slow down a bit because I do think that there's a percentage of customers that might not want to, you know, or might feel slightly, uh, what's the right word? Can't think of the right word, conflicted about buying as much fast fashion as they would have done in the past. Um, apologies for this. Um, it's a really interesting model I just found the other day. Apologies to Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. This is the hierarchy of needs. And I think if you think about what's, what this looked like um, two years ago or even a year ago, the pyramid was probably upside down and the segment at the bottom was all about buying. And then you had, you know, making, thrifting, swapping and borrowing and then use what you have. And I think that this is going to turn on its head. Buying becomes, I'm not suggesting again that none of us are going to buy. I just think there are alternatives that we might reconsider in the future. And that also leads me into the circular economy. So, you know, from the production of a product, whereby historically as retailers we produce things that have been really made to be thrown away in the end. I definitely don't think we're going to be doing that. We'll be producing products, whether it's fashion or electric, electronics or whatever it happens to be, or furniture, um, which has another life, whether it has to be repurposed into something new, into another piece of furniture like IKEA have been doing, or whatever it is, I think we'll be producing products and we'll be thinking about the full product life cycle, which is way beyond the first lifetime or iteration of that product. Um, and everything will be made to be recycled in the end. Hyper-localization. I think that consumers will, will want to shop and continue to shop locally, both domestically, but this is also an opportunity, I think, from an international point of view. And leveraging cross-border players like eShop World, which enables you to basically localize the checkout localized content, localized marketing, localized logistics, localized delivery propositions and everything else is a great way to go. And I think that, you know, it is an opportunity for a lot of our brands in this country to think beyond our borders. So whilst a number of our domestic consumers are going to be shopping locally, there's no reason why you cannot come across as a local player in Spain, in Germany, in the Middle East, in the Far East, but you need the right support to enable you to do that. And I also think hyper-personalization, which is almost like a, I guess, a, a level on from localization, which is where you localize the product proposition, the content proposition, and the messaging very much, not only to who that person is and what they've bought in the past, but also what's happening at that moment in time. And this is a great example from Timberland, where they're actually showing in the bottom left-hand corner of that screen grab there what the local weather is, and they're serving up pair of products that might be relevant for, 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 for that customer and for the weather at that moment in time. That has to be a permanent change. We've been talking about personalization for decades and you know you can count on one or two hands the amount of brands that are delivering <coughs> excuse me, fully personalized experiences at the moment. Excuse me a second. As I spill a bit of water. Convenience is still key. <coughs> so Think about um, what, what we've been going through here. Having the ability to pre-order certain products and know that you're always in stock of them is another mind shift. So subscription services, the ability to pre-order is definitely something that consumers are going to want to do. Bulk ordering is something we're going to want to do. Family size is something we're going to be thinking about. And it's a merchandising opportunity for lots of retailers 
whether you're in fashion or whether you're in general merchandise, to bundle up products, care packs, fitness packs, hygiene packs, safety packs, fun packs, and all sorts of new ways of being able to merchandise and engage with customers in the future. That I see as being a permanent change. And what about these three little letters? Work from home. So I'm not suggesting that all of us are gonna be working from home in the future, but I'm pretty sure that some of us will. Um, and that many of you, are, many, whether there are some CEOs on the call today, or those of you that work for CEOs will be thinking about, you know, do we need those big swanky offices in the West End of London, or wherever you happen to be located at the moment, or actually could a whole chunk, a whole swathe of our workforce now be working from home? And when it comes to business continuity planning, wouldn't that be a great way of being more secure about the future of your business should you ever find yourselves in this sort of situation in the future? That is a permanent change. Do I see everyone working from home? No, I don't. But I do see a chunk of us doing that probably in the future. I'm going to talk now about diversity. And these lovely looking girls are my daughters, Saskia and Antonia. Both of them have hidden disabilities. I'm not going to go into the details of what those are. But why I'm, why I'm using this as an example is that I think that retailers do a really bad job at the moment in the UK of catering for the needs of customers who have hidden disabilities. And hidden disabilities can be anything from, you know, issues with visual impairment, hearing impairment, uh, Crohn's, you name it, a whole swathe of different issues. Um, retailers cater really badly for visually impaired customers. There's so many examples of brands that won't let, you know, uh, blind or visually impaired customers into their stores with guide dogs. Why? It's not against the law, but because they haven't trained their staff to deal with these situations accordingly. That's something that has to become a permanent change. 20% of the population of the UK is an ethnic minority, and yet too many of our boards still look like that. Pale, male, and stale. Unfortunately, I probably fall into that category as well. That has to be a permanent change. Even more so when you consider that women drive 70 to 80% of all consumer purchasing decisions in the UK, and yet in the FTSE 350 are 350 biggest businesses. There are only 12 female CEOs, and that is down from 18 in 2016. How can that be right? It's ridiculous. But it's not only, it's not only ridiculous, it's commercially disastrous. Because how can those boards be representative of the customers they're serving if more than three quarters of the consumers that make a decision, a purchasing decision, are female, and yet it's mainly men that are running our businesses? So there has to be a better balance there and that has to be a permanent change. Some of you all heard me talk about this before. A customer is for life and not just for Christmas. And it so frustrates me now how many businesses I buy from online, in stores, who cannot personalize any of the experience. You know, I often use examples of when I buy something, I bought some skincare from Liberty and my wife treated me, treated me to a new skincare regime last year in Liberty. And um, the first email I got was to sort of spruce up my woman's work wardrobe. You know, no level of, you know, it's not even gender relevant, never mind any personalization. However, saying that, even the biggest retailers can sometimes get it wrong. So here's an amusing tweet that I'll let you read for a second about Amazon. Oh, sorry, I'll come on to that in a minute. I got ahead of myself. A 5% spoiled the punchline there. A 5% increase in customer retention leads to a 25 to 95% increase in profit. And that is why, you know, personalization, loyalty is so important. We've been talking about customer relationship management, CRM, another three-letter acronym. We've been talking about that since the early 2000s. That's when that term was coined. How many businesses are building a relationship with you? How many businesses are sending? truly targeted communication to you that's based on who you are, where you live, what you like, what you buy, what you don't like, what, how you feel, almost no one. Here's the example from, from Amazon. I guess in the context of doing a webinar, given that I can't hear any of the responses, I'm going to hope that you're laughing out loud at the moment. This is my local barber shop. As you can tell, like all of you, I haven't managed to get there yet um, for a while, but hopefully we'll do soon. Um, this is the, this barber shop is made up of five Greek Cypriot barbers, five Greek Cypriot barbers in Cock Fosters, and they have two hundred and forty thousand followers on Instagram. And I bet you there are a whole bunch of you on here that work for some fairly big brands 
who don't have anything like that level of engagement on Instagram. And all it is is about just engaging with customers. You know, Harry, who's the guy in the middle there, he's doing live connections to his um, fans on a, on, a, on a Friday night and a Saturday night just to keep the dialogue going. But what's so impressive about them is through all of the marketing they've been doing on social media, they now deliver trading all over the world. Sadly, that's obviously come to a halt in recent times, but they'll get back to that. They deliver trading in South America, in, in the US, in Sweden, in Chile, in the Far East. They, you know, all from a barber shop in Cockfosters. They created a global brand through social media. It's just fantastic. Such a great example of what you can do. The long and short of all of this is, unfortunately, shift happens and we need to get over it. And one of the terms that you're going to hear bandied around at the moment is pivoting. And it, it's talked about as if pivoting is the new, is the, is the kind of buzzword and every business needs to be able to pivot. Yes, they do, but it's the new business normal. It has to become part, a fundamental part of the strategy. You know, what happens when something goes wrong? You know, clearly business continuity planning and disaster recovery just wasn't fit for purpose. You know, think of all the people that work in that industry. You know, what have they been telling you for the last 20 years? Why has no one talked about an event like this? Okay, we've never been through anything like this. Why has nobody said what happens if all our stores close? How do we continue our business? So I think here's another uh, new three-letter acronym for you. You might be familiar with CPR. That's what businesses need. They need to come back from coronavirus with a clear plan, a clear strategy of how they're going to engage with customers, how they're going to get their businesses open. They're going to have to make sure they're pandemic proof because let's be honest, the chances are this will probably happen again at some point, whether it's a second wave of this or whether it's another pandemic at some point in their lifetime. And they need to be recession proof. And the other thing is, it always amazes me why businesses just accept the fact the fact that even though they are open 365 days, well, they're not open three, 365 days a year, but we have 365 days a year in our calendar. And arguably, if you have a website, you are open 365 days a year, if you're, even if you're not fulfilling orders every single day. Why do we take for granted or just accept the fact that we have times of the year when things are quieter? Why are we not thinking and using an opportunity like this, which I hope we will do, to think about how do we pivot? How do we make sure when we have a lull, when things aren't actually a bit quieter, that we maybe repurpose part of our business and we take advantage of this and we actually turn it into another way of, de of generating demand? It could be you have a physical retail store and that you become a logistics provider for someone else. You become a hub for somebody else's business during your quiet period. Who knows? There are lots of things that you can do. Try the business I talked about earlier. It's enabling customers to try before you buy. You know, when all the retailers closed their stores, you'd have been quite, it would have been quite understandable to think they would have just wanted to go and hide under a rock, not knowing what to do. No, they pivoted. And what they did is they started selling, they started selling and delivering groceries. So if you go into their website now and you go try tryd.co.uk forward slash uh, essentials, you can get deliveries from them. What a fantastic example of how to pivot at a time like this. And finally, I really think that brands need a local supply chain, you know, and I'm, I, I'm not suggesting for a second that all of a sudden we manufacture everything in the UK, but given that the, the supply chain has clearly been broken, uh, and if we look at what's happened, obviously, during the course of this period of time, you know, doesn't it make sense now to start sourcing products locally again? Think of all the manufacturing sectors that have been killed in the UK in the last 30, 40 years as everything's gone to China. You know, isn't this, a, isn't this the time where we can start to think about how we source locally and how we start to build up the economy locally as a result of doing so as well? I hope you enjoyed my little, per, my little presentation. Um, I'm going to take questions in a minute. Just before I do, I'm going to ask a favor of you all. I'm running a survey at the moment and I'm running it because I want to capture as much insight and feedback as I can from you because you're all consumers and from anyone else you know about how you're feeling about things at the moment, how you think your behavior might change in the future. I want to substantiate some of the stuff I've been talking about, but also learn some additional insight. So I'd be really grateful if you take a few minutes to go into customerserviceaction.com forward slash save the high street. It's five minutes of your time. We will publish the insight that we generate. We've already had um, a few hundred people uh, take part. 
We'd like to get to probably a thousand plus. Um, and we will also use that insight to share it with our retailers and share it with our other brands that are on the high street in order to help them and give them the insight of what they need to do to maintain the relevance and to engage with consumers when we come out of this situation. If you do want to know more or you want to follow me on any of my channels, here's a list of the different ones that I have. I've got a TV channel, I've got a podcast. You can follow me on Twitter, you can email me. Um, and I think that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope we've got a few questions. So I will now hand back in my hand back to studio, as they say, to Chloe. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm sure our audience will agree that was a great session filled with a lot of informative advice. Let's have a look at some of the questions we've had in from the live chat. The first one is from Paul. Companies have been behaving externally to their customers very differently during these times. Do you think those retailers that haven't handled things very well, for example, the range and weather spoons, will be punished by consumers in the long term? It's a great question and it's always hard to know. Like I said at the very outset of my presentation, you know, some habits stick, some don't. But I also talked about the importance of values and I really believe that this period of time has really heightened everyone's awareness of what, what our values really need to be. You know, look at what we do every Thursday night at eight o'clock when we come out of our houses and we clap for the NHS. You know, we've all been looking out for our elderly neighbours, I'm sure. We've all been much more community focused. And, and I think that that also aligns itself with the values and the values that the businesses that we engage with or choose to engage with communicate to us. And I really think that some of those businesses have shot themselves in their foot pretty significantly. Do I think it will be a lasting change? Probably not for the majority of consumers. For some it will. I think there will be a, a certain percentage, probably a relatively small percentage of consumers who will automatically not go back somewhere as a result of the way that some of these brands have behaved during this crisis. Um, in the short term, I think it will have a bigger impact. In the short term, I think there will be quite a lot of people who will decide not to spend their money with some of these brands. But over the longer term, I think uh, we, we do tend to forget things over the longer period of time. Okay, the next question is from Karen. What do you think hospitality will look like on the other side? Pubs, cafes, restaurants and hotels? Great question, Karen. Um, and unfortunately, that is a sector that's probably going to be even harder hit than retail. Um, maybe not quite as hard affected as the airlines, but, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, interestingly, uh, I, a friend of mine has a business, I think it's called Satelliet, um, I noticed that he's manufactured these screens that can go between tables and, or you can clip onto the, in fact, it sits, I think, on the floor. It's a, a tough cardboard with a, pla a perspex screen that can sit beside, at the side of a table um, in a restaurant that I think will give consumers the confidence to sit at a table in a restaurant. So there'll be lots of these sorts of solutions that will come out. I talked earlier about pubs thinking about how to leverage digital channels. So if someone can't come to the can't actually physically come to the pub. How do you take the pub to them? If, if I'm a consumer and I'm too nervous to come into your environment because of social distancing and fear of picking up coronavirus, why not allow me to engage digitally? Why not run quiz nights? Why not run fun nights? Why not run you know, um, happy hours and give me the opportunity to buy, my, to buy alcohol, to buy food from you as a business? I think there's you just got to think outside the box and think about how we use all the channels that are available to us in order to continue that engagement. Restaurants are going to have to work really hard to build their takeaway and delivery side of their business. So they're going to have to have the right logistics partners like the Deliveroo's, the Uber Eats, the Just Eats. They're going to have, you know, that's the side of their business that's going to help them, I think, to continue demand, not only now, but in the short term, whilst consumers are reluctant to maybe come into the physical restaurant. Uh, but ultimately, they're, going to, they're not going to be able to have as many tables, which means they're not going to have as many covers. But I, think, I still think they can make it a success if they just leverage, as I say, digital channels and leverage logistics and understand how consumer behaviours change and how to tap into that. The next question is from Rebecca. As a startup business in the cosmetics and fashion industry, what would be your top tips for engaging customers during COVID-19? Wow, good question, Rebecca. As a startup business in the, sorry, just say that again to me. Was it the fa beauty? Cosmetics and fashion. Cosmetics and fashion. Um, 
So I don't know if you already have a customer database. I'm sure you have something. It sounds like you're a relative early business. It, it might be just worth asking Rebecca, actually, I don't know where she can respond straight away, whether she's got stores or whether it's just a digital business. I'm assuming she's got a physical business by the nature of the question. Anyway, um, I mean, if you've got a physical business, then obviously you can't open your doors at the moment. So hopefully you've got a website. Hopefully you've got your own website. But even if you have your own website, you can be going onto a platform like down your high street which would enable you to leverage their customer base and sell way beyond the confines of your own locality. So I think there are lots of ways to continue uh, the engagement with customers. If you have got a database, as I said earlier, I would empathize with customers. I think you should tell them that you feel for them. You hope that they're keeping well. I probably wouldn't be taking a pro an overtly promotional stance to what I'm doing. It would be more of, a, more of an empathetic one you know, we feel for you and maybe try and build a bit of rapport, maybe even a bit of humor just to lighten the mood in your communication um, would be some of the ways that I would go about it. I would, if you have a website, I pro I may, you, maybe you could offer them some incentives. Um, yeah, not much more than that I can say at the moment. Next one is from Monty. Some high street retailers were in trouble before the pandemic. Do you think there is an opportunity to keep these going after COVID? Yeah, I mean, obviously there, 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 there are a host of sort of more traditional established multi-channel retailers that have been in difficulty. And I think one of the issues there is that many of them, unfortunately, were just a little bit slow to change, to pivot. Uh, that wasn't the core part of the strategy and they were too slow to close stores and recognize the world that we live in today. And, you know, many of them now have in excess of 30% of their sales online most of those sales are, are not incremental. Most of those sales, what I would call channel shift, where customers have gone from being a store customer to an online customer. So in that context, if, you, if all of a sudden a third of your customers are now buying online, who used to shop in a store, it goes without saying you've got too many stores. So there are certain retailers will probably have a really difficult time because, because of that factor. Hopefully, most of them will be able to agree arrangements with landlords, will be able to come out, of you know any of those lease arrangements that they're in, close the stores that are less profitable, trim down the retail, the real estate, have a smaller store por store portfolio, and a bigger online business. Because um, if you were starting a retail business today, a, a lot of these brands they wouldn't have 200 stores. They'd probably have 10 or 12 flagship stores across the UK in the major towns and cities. They might have smaller format stores, like I was talking about earlier, like John Lewis could do and then they'd have a significant online business. Okay, the next question is from Mark. What sectors do you see having a stronger reopening versus those who really need to think about how they reopen in the future? Well, I think everyone has to think about how, they, good question, Mark. I think everyone has to think about how, how best they reopen. And obviously to some extent, we're not really in control of that because ultimately the government are going to define what the exit strategy is and they're going to define which sectors open first, followed by which sector after that. Um, I'm fairly sure retail is going to be one of the first sectors that they are going to um, suggest more and more stores can open. And we've already obviously got, we've had the grocers open the whole way through. We've, had, we've seen more and more of the DIY, the big sheds, the home bases, the B&Qs opening. Um, but I think and I hope the government will recognize that lots of us won't feel that comfortable going into bigger retail format environments with lots where there are potentially lots of people in the short term. And so I think that smaller store formats lend themselves well, maybe and maybe better in the short term. So hopefully they'll recognize that when they decide which retail, which segments of retail or sectors of retail they, they open and in which order. But I think retail will probably be first. I would imagine they will they will um, probably relax the restaurant sector to some extent, whether that's opening up the Costa Coffees, the Starbucks, the Cafe Nero's, but, but, but maintaining or sorry, enforcing them or asking them to keep the seated part of their establishment closed, but keeping the, but, but enabling consumers, consumers, I can't talk now, enabling consumers to go in and, and, and take away a cup of coffee. That's what they were doing just before we went into lockdown. So. I have a feeling something like that might happen. Um, and then hopefully they'll start to open the restaurants, but the restaurants will keep the takeaway side of their businesses going and promoting that as effectively as they can in the short term, making sure you're on all the right 
delivery partner platforms like Deliveroo, Just Eats, and Uber Eats. Um, and then other, other sectors will go after, will come after that. Um, travel's a really complicated one. I mean, the trains are still running, the tubes are still running. I'm sure for those of us that live in London, we're all pretty concerned about, you know, what happens when, if we are going back to work and we are go, working in London and we get on the tube, we know there's less tubes. You know, how are you going to manage social distancing when you're getting to the, you know, when you're getting to the barrier? How are you going to manage it when you're queuing on the platform? I don't know how any of that's going to be dealt with, but hopefully when, you know, when we, when we have the, the, the briefing next week, there'll be some information around that. Airlines, you know, difficult one because not many of us are going to be traveling either for business or, or, or holiday travel anytime soon. And I think that's a sector that's going to have to, obviously, there's a lot going on there at the moment, but they're going to have to think really hard about, you know, how they, how they allow cons or how they enable consumers to feel comfortable within that environment. Just, just for a second, going back to retail, I mean, I talked about some of the things that retailers can do uh, and restaurants can do. And again, I, I just think it's thinking about how do you leverage digital? How do you leverage the fact what we're doing at the moment? We're all engaging on Zoom calls and, you know, Microsoft Teams and whatever it is. We're already, our behavior is already changing at the moment. So you might be out there in the physical world, but how do you enable people to continue that relationship with you through these channels? Why wouldn't they? Particularly if they don't feel comfortable coming into the physical environment. So I think there's an opportunity for most businesses that are multi-channel to take more advantage of all of those channels. That was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> the, uh, we've had a few questions around the cleaning industry, so I'm just going to um, put them together. What do you think will happen with the cleaning industry and how do you see the service industry picking up post lockdown? The cleaning industry. And is that so that does that mean I'm not really sure whether that's referring to cleaning businesses or cleaning people's homes? So there's one that's um, domestic and commercial cleaning, and then there is one that is, uh, let me just find it, there's one that is a dry cleaning. Right, interesting. Okay, try and do that quickly. Um, so if we take domestic cleaning, I mean, we, we, my wife has a lady that helps one day a week. Uh, she comes in for a few hours. Um, we, she hasn't been coming in for the period of, of uh, of the lockdown but we've still been paying her because we felt that was the right thing to do because otherwise as a self-employed person she would lose all of her income so hopefully most people are doing the same thing and um, i don't really know the answer to that I'd probably i have to ask my wife and see how she how she felt about having her back in the house i think we will be open to that because we're already going into grocers and many of us are already out there doing in the environment where there are other human beings and trying to stick two meters apart so sh surely you can have one person in your house cleaning one room while you're in another room. So I'm sure we'll get over that. Um, with regards to, what was the second part of that question? The service industry picking up post lockdown. Um, well, again, it depends. it's a massive question because the service sector is like this. Um, I think lots of services will still, lots of services will probably pick up quite quickly. They'll be, in, they'll be incredibly re relevant. You take what's going on around logistics at the moment, obviously logistics has never been more relevant and service sector businesses have to be thinking it similarly. They have to be thinking about, you know, if we can't engage with somebody physically, how do we do so digitally? How do we use mobile? How do we create apps? How do we find other ways to engage with our customers and create services that are convenient to them, that make them feel safe um, and enable us to continue our business? Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. This one has come through anonymous. Will there be enough profitability for businesses such as gyms in the new normal, mm -hmm. even providing paid content if they have a if they have to maintain large and expensive physical spaces with fewer customers? Presumably, prices will have to go up. So that's a really great question, and but I do think that there is the opportunity to balance that by having a lot of paid for digital content because I think quite a number of, take, take how many of us are going to be working from home. For all those people that are working from home, they're not going to be going, they're probably not going to be going to a gym like they used to do on their way into work or after work. So there's a whole new segment of customers that you could be engaging with through digital channels and continue that relationship. Then it's maybe a model like Pure Gym, um, where it's a cheaper price point, it's um, affordable, it's, you're not tied into onerous contracts for a year. If you want to leave I think you have to think outside the box, leverage digital, be more flexible with pricing and the contracts 
Yes, I think there is absolutely still a future for the physical gym environment, but they're obviously also going to have to make sure that people feel safe when they're in there. And that probably means having one, sh one machine working, two not working, and then the fourth one working so there's enough of a social distance between each. Um, are you going to talk about any other questions that I'd be happy to answer afterwards, Chloe? Unfortunately, that's all the time we've. That's all the time we've got time for for the questions. Um, but I have just put in the comments Martin's email address, and he sure. said that um, if we were unable to answer your question today, then um, he's more than happy for you to get in touch um, with the email address in the comment section. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you took something from it. And look forward to seeing you on the other side. Martin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. If, Thanks, there, and if there is anything you'd like to catch up on from today's session, then we'll be sending out a replay of the webinar coming shortly to our social media channels. Our next webinar in the Lockdown Learning for Business series takes place on Monday the 4th of May at 2 p.m. and will be joined by Alison Edgar as she discusses sales in a digital world. If you haven't already, you can register for this webinar at www freshbusinessthinking.haysummit.com or you can click on the link in the comments. Thank you for joining us today and thank you again, Martin. Cheers.